It's also my birthday. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> sing me a birthday song. No, don't. Um, so uh, today our presentation is titled Scaling and Polishing is for Designers, Not Just Dentists. I really have no excuse for this title. <laughs> I just like puns. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Jill. Um, hi, I'm Sumit. We're product designers at Zendesk. Um, I'm focused mainly on the Zendesk message product, which is part of the Zendesk platform, and I'll tell you more about that later. Before I was a product designer here, I was actually an illustrator and, and brand designer here as well for a couple of years. And before that, I did brand and web projects mostly with other clients. So I work mainly on the Zendesk chat product, which Jill will explain more a bit later. So before that, I graduated from industrial design before joining Zendesk. So I created this device that can pour light, and I traveled to Dubai to showcase it. Okay, yes. so because our talk is mostly about what we design at Zendesk and how we design at Zendesk, we thought we'd better answer the question first, like what the heck is Zendesk, which I think a lot of you won't know. Um, so Zendesk is uh, customer service software, basically any way in which a business wants to talk to its customers, so whether that's like by email or phone or like the FAQ page on your website, Zendesk wants to be the platform that enables that communication. So I mentioned before I focus on Zendesk message, so that deals with social messaging channels, so stuff like Facebook Messenger, Twitter, Line, and Simon deals with Zendesk chat, and so that is a live chat software which is on websites and apps. So these are all the products that are on our Zendesk platform. OK, so design that scales, what does that mean to us? We've kind of identified these three areas in which growth has really caused some interesting growing pains and challenges, which we found scalable design to be a really important part of how to solve. So today, we're going to share a bit about how and why we've tried to implement this at Zendesk. OK, let's go. Growing platform, what does that mean? This dude <laughs> was our original Zendesk brand. They called him the Buddy, which is a combination of Buddha and Buddy. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> so the Buddy is just a calm guy. He's just a Zen soul in the very chaotic and unglamorous world of customer service. That was the vision. And our founders who founded Zendesk in Copenhagen, they were just focused on email support in 2007, and they wanted a software that was nice to look at, easy to use, very different from like typical boring, painful enterprise software that was out there at the time. And it worked really well for them. Zendesk grew really fast and ended up acquiring three companies. A lot of you may know Zopin, which was a Singapore startup that was acquired. It deals with live chat software. So basically, you know, Simon works on Zendesk chat. That's Zopin, but it was rebranded. Uh, Zendesk also acquired BIME, which deals in analytics, and acquired Outbound, which deals with proactive messaging. So there are all these acquisitions, right? All over the world. BIME is in France. Zopim is in Singapore. And they're simultaneously developing other products as well over the years. So we developed Help Center in Copenhagen, Talk in Ireland, Connect in Australia. And as you can imagine, when you've got like a whole bunch of different teams designing different products all over the world, you're going to end up with some really disjointed experiences, different brands, different experiences, different expectations within the product. And we had this vision, right, of like a seamless Zendesk ecosystem where an agent could come in and just go from software to software and have a really nice time working with our software. And some of this really didn't play well with that vision. And so as idealistic designers, as we all tend to be, we feel sometimes like this. <laughs> Oh no, I hope my boss doesn't see that. Okay, um, so going back to our brand, <laughs> going back to our brand. So what we did to solve this problem was first we looked at our brand, right? And we looked at this and we were like, I mean, firstly, it's a Buddha. Secondly, like it just doesn't scale. We need like a brand that really can scale with our platform, right? We need a new brand with room to grow. So we started thinking about what makes a brand family. What is it to have diversity within lots of different products and yet unity within the Zendesk platform? We looked at super simple solutions and like crazy color palettes, textures, photography, patterns. And all the while we asked ourselves, what are the values of Zendesk and how can we represent them visually? So this was the brand that we launched at the end of last year. Basically, every, product is, um, every product's brand encompasses two simple shapes. We call them 
the relationships. <laughs> And, and so essentially, it represents the communication that happens just between two people. You know, you want to have any relationship, you just need to make, make one connection between two people. And that's really what we want. At the heart of our software, it's just two people making a connection. And so the two shapes, as you saw before, they're like fighting or they're playing or they're jumping. And that's what we want. Um, our, 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 our platform to enable people to do, to have that interaction. So we developed this system that has really simple rules and guidelines that make it super easy. So if we develop a new product or we acquire a new company, we know that if we want to, we could integrate it into this system really easily. And at the same time, while maintaining that unity, we know that each product can have a really diverse and built out universe. So they all live very independently and yet very harmoniously together. So it can still be a really lively, quirky, and vibrant brand, even though it's just like simple shapes. It still holds true to that original Zendesk vision of being this creative and charming brand that's not you know, painful and boring, hopefully. And yeah, so that's how we built out a scalable brand system for a growing platform. But of course, that was not the whole solution. <laughs> Besides the rebrand that Jill mentioned, the product team is also looking to create a unified experience across the Zendesk platform. So as you can see, this is what we looked like before. So the level of inconsistency and fragmentation between the products is pretty obvious. We had many different treatments of type, color, and layout that just doesn't seem to work together. We soon grew to realize that we needed some form of an alignment. And that's why we created our design system called Garden. So Garden is still a pretty small team based in San Francisco with about 1.5 designers and two developers. <laughs> yes. So one of the major projects that the Garden team is working on is to provide alignments to our icons. So why icons, you may ask? It seems very basic, but what happens when we have many designers across different countries turning and creating assets for different products? we end up with many, many, many icons, some of which look the same but are used for, this, for different purposes and others that look different but are used for the same purpose. So what do I mean? So take this eye icon as an example. So we currently use this icon in three of our products right now. So in chat mobile, it indicates when a visitor is looking at a link. In the chat dashboard, it means that the visitor is active on your website. In support, it shows that another agent is looking at the ticket, and in guide, it is to customize the design. So all of this kind of show how we use the same icons for different use cases, which might be confusing for our users who are actually moving across different platforms, because that means that they have to relearn what this eye icon means. Another example would be the thumbs up and thumbs down icon, where they all kind of reflect a similar rating system, but right now, we have about four different styles. So over here, you can see that we have a combination of line icons and fill icons, some of which are joined and others are uh, together. So this also means that there are four different designers designing the same icon, which seems to be very ineffective. So what now? As you can see, this is just an example where the design system is needed. So when the garden team first started on this project, we had to all dump our icons into one document, and it's now 70, 77 pages long. Pretty insane. So we are still working through this project, but along the way, we have found Brand AI to be a pretty useful tool as like a common resource file, or what we call the source of truth. So all the approved icons are kind of consolidated into this plugin where we could just drag and drop it into our design files. So the second area that I talked about, a growing audience, what does that mean? So as I mentioned before, Zendus grew really fast through like acquisitions, product, new products being developed. And as it grew, that meant that our audience became more and more diverse. So right now, we have around like 35% non-English speaking accounts, which is pretty high, it's like more than one in three. And we're in around 150 countries and territories and we support over 40 languages. So that's a super diverse audience. And on top of that, we have customers like these who are international brands in and of themselves and they need to support a really international audience as well. So how can we help them do that? 
So a big part of that solution is the IATN team. So for those of you who don't know, IATN is the short form for internationalization. And our internationalization team basically helps us to localize all our products into different languages. They themselves are distributed all around the world. So we're lucky enough to have like one IATN guy who sits right near the designers and we disturb him all the time. So as designers, we really need to take the effort to poke them and be like, hey, can you please look at my design? Because we need their perspective. So let me give you an example. So you might, for example, design something like this, and you're like, okay, that's fine, I guess. Like, let's ship that. That looks all right. But an IETN person might look at this and be like, uh, wait, hold on. What would happen when I translate all these strings and they become much longer? What would happen, what would happen then? You might get something horrible like this. Okay, wait. Firstly, I'm super, super, super sorry if you speak Tagalog because it's like I Google translate all the text, so I'm sure this is gibberish. So I'm very, very sorry if you speak Tagalog. <laughs> I'm sure it's nonsense. But okay, it was just to make a point, okay? And my point is, you can see certain parts like how your text starts to like truncate or like one line becomes two lines or like things get super long and then it knocks everything else down. Like that is like d disaster. If you ship something and then someone in another language saw this, you'd be like, oh my God, quit my job. So... <laughs> Yeah, so how do we kind of try to handle that? Um, so this is actually a tool that one of our colleagues made. So basically, you can type in the English text, and it gives you, again, it's Google Translator, but it's an estimation of how long it might be. So you can see something like this, where it's like save and continue is in English, and then it's translated. And you can see that the string length can change anywhere from between five characters to like 24 characters. So if you think about that when you design, how much variation do you need to account for in your design, right? It definitely will change the way that you design something. Yeah. Again, it's not accurate, lah. Don't look at the... Okay, anyway, as we did this presentation, I asked the IETN team for like funny things that I could share with you all. So I'm going to share with you all some silly stuff. Um, so in the Zenest message product, we have this tab called the active tab. It's where all your ongoing conversations live. Okay, so it's like ongoing conversations. And when it got machine translated, so before an IETN person had seen it, it got translated to like Huotong. <laughs> Which, for those of you who, who don't speak Chinese, means like physically active, like you're running. It's like so dumb, like it's totally nonsensical. And if you put yourself in the shoes of like a Chinese speaking agent, you only speak Chinese, you open up the software and you just be like, what the heck is a huotong, like tab, like it's just ridiculous. Okay, and like another one, so we've got two lists. One is all, so it's for all the agents, and one is mine, meaning it's assigned to you. So as you can imagine, this got translated to this, like a minor. Okay, I don't know how to say that Chinese word, but it's like means minor, okay? So I just thought that was just really dumb because again, imagine you are an, a, a, you know, a business owner. All you want to do is talk to your customers, um, talk to your customers on Facebook Messenger, for example, and then you open this up and you see that there's something that's like asking you to mine something. Like, it's just so stupid. So. Our point is, bad translations are just bad UX. <laughs> like, you, you have to care about it. And it's such a good example for me of like, you, you might try so hard and you design something, you put so much thought into it, you go and research it, then your developer codes it out and it's beautiful, but then one shitty translation <laughs> results in a totally broken user experience, right? I mean, you can see how that would be awful. So for us, it's really important for people to, if you're trying to cater for a diverse audience, to invest in an IT9 team that not only is good, but cares about your product and knows your product well. They understand when mine means mine and not mine. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't, it's not just limited to like language. So for example, this was an illustration that we did for some collateral in American and European markets. And we, you know, it's very quintessentially San Francisco and, you know, Chinese takeout. Um, but they wanted to use the same collateral for Asian markets, specifically the Chinese market. So at that time, I happened to be the only Asian designer on the brand team. And immediately I was like, no, 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 you cannot use that. Um, because it's really inauspicious. A lot of us who live in Singapore would know that's really inauspicious to have like the chopsticks sticking out of your food like that. And so immediately they were like, oh, okay. So they, they took it, they didn't really understand, but they were like, okay, let's remove. Um, and I just thought it was a good example that I could think of where a diverse team really helps when you are looking at a diverse audience. Like if you're trying to support a diverse group of people, your team, it's great if your team is diverse because it really helps to mitigate a lot of that stuff that you may not know, like cultural sensitivity, who knows. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about in this, in this section is all the shades of grey. So we know that designers love shades of grey, and we know that we love using many, many, many different shades of grey on top of other shades of grey. 
Um, there are some engineers in the corner who I feel are smirking at me because we are big culprits of this. Like, we will definitely sometimes have bad contrast issues. And, but we're trying to ask ourselves more and more, what does this mean when you're looking at a design on a low-quality 12-inch display, non-retina monitors, right? How does it work for the colorblind or people with visual impairments? Are you excluding people just through your design? So one way that we've tried to help this is, oh, okay, yes, that's really bad. Okay, there's this plugin in Sketch that we use that's called the Color Contrast Analyzer. And basically, <laughs> the contrast in these two things is so bad you can't even see it on the projector. But it's like white text on light blue background. Okay, and basically what you do is you select two options and it does the color contrast for you and it gives you the ratio. So we know according to the web uh, content accessibility guidelines, the ratio that passes is like 2.7. So this like 1.1 to 1 is like a mega fail, obviously. Um, yeah, so we put together some resources, and we're gonna we're gonna give out the the presentation after the event. So hopefully you'll get this in your inbox, so you can click around and see. But I've put a link to like the plugin that I mentioned, as well as the web content accessibility guidelines that we mentioned, and some other links that we found really helpful for how to design in a more inclusive way. Because we really feel that's your responsibility. If you have a diverse audience, you need to include them. So the final way in which Zendesk has really grown is through our internal de design team. So we have about 30 plus product designers in, distributed across six different countries from Singapore to Copenhagen to San Francisco. So we collaborate regularly across the world even though we all work on different products. So just one example of the challenge that we face with such a distributed team. So this was an actual screenshot of a timetable that we tried to take um, to schedule a call across Singapore, Copenhagen, San Francisco, and Melbourne. As you can see, it is almost impossible. So one of the main things that we have learned or are still painfully learning is all about communication. So with a decentralized team structure, we have really learned to embrace asynchronous communication. And that means taking the extra time and effort to reach out and stay engaged with other designers in other countries. So it's definitely a lot easier to go up to someone and be like, hey, Jill, can I, can I borrow your eyes on something? Sure. As compared, <laughs> as compared to writing your thoughts down, because that involves crafting the message. We have to first set the context, over explain, and finally wait for a reply, which in this, game, in this case came weeks later. So, but we have kind of really embraced this process, whether it's like sending someone a personal Slack message or actually commenting actively on InVision. So investing in documentation is also really important. So again, taking the time to explain why we chose A versus B can feel tiresome sometimes, but it does go a long way. It doesn't just help you, it also helps other designers and stakeholders involved to understand why something was designed in a certain way and also to provide a useful point of reference for others who are working on similar projects. So the design team in, in Zendesk uses Basecamp for project updates and progress. So the general structure that we have found to be really helpful was to first set the context, second, highlight your problem, third, present your solution and explorations, and finally, any future considerations. So we also invest a lot in travel, where we proactively go to other offices and talk face-to-face, -face because in spite of all of this, nothing really beats face-to-face -face communication. So I started out my Zendesk journey at the Creative Offsite in San Francisco last year. So there were many, many presentations ma made, and it was kind of good to see everyone gathering together to share about what they were working on. Besides work-related stuff, it is also important for us to get to know our colleagues on a, on a personal level, and offsites are a great way for a distributed team to do this. So this year, we went to London and Paris. So apart from offsites, we also go down to other offices pro for project-specific needs. So this was when I went down to Melbourne for a unification project, and Shreen, another designer here, just came back from Melbourne last week. So, okay, we wish we could travel all the time, <laughs> but we can't. So we try to get a lot of FaceTime through video calls, as you would imagine. So we do a lot of regular sync ups, and you can see in the photo on the right, we're actually literally standing up because we were doing a stand up and we wanted to feel like we were all in the same room. Not really. 
uh, didn't, didn't really work. But yeah, um, so another way that we have actually found really helpful, like Simon was mentioning, it's about building relationship. And sometimes you can't just keep talking about work. So one of the biggest reasons we actually started our Instagram page, which is super random, is really because we felt that if every time I talk to my colleague, it's always about work, right? It's always about a project or a pattern. You're never going to really be able to build that relationship that you want to build. So we were trying to just kind of give a glimpse into our lives in the office, but outside of work, to our, especially to our international colleagues. So even if it's something as silly as like drawing on balloons, <laughs> um, yeah, we thought, why not? Let's share that part of, of, of our team. And I'm, I'm just saying, you can follow us. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, no pressure. You can have snacks if you follow us. OK, so a recap. So there are three areas where scalable design has really helped a growing platform, a growing audience, and a growing creative team. And throughout the talk, we've mentioned a whole bunch of tools that have been helpful to us and hopefully will be helpful to you guys. So again, I've collated it, and this will be in your inboxes, hopefully. So Simon mentioned brand.ai. It's where our design component library lives. It's where our design system lives, basically. A lot of you who use Sketch would know that in their latest update, they just released Sketch libraries, which is pretty great. So definitely, if you've never tried to design a design system, go and try it. It's, we found it really helpful, and yeah, it's fun to do, I think. So um, we also use Basecamp, as Simon mentioned, for documentation. So we like to, yeah, just put our thoughts in a place where other people can find it and read it. InVision is used a lot for prototypes and flows, because it's really easy to like click and leave a comment on your own time. Slack is where we slack. <laughs> <laughs> Dropbox is um, where we put our files, and we've also we've also found Dropbox Paper really helpful for collaborative writing. So it's a relatively new product. If you've never tried it, highly uh, recommend it. It's really nice to use. Uh, Trello is useful when you're kind of doing a project that has a lot of parts. So if I'm doing a project where I want to put like a Kanban style, like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm doing this now and I finished this, it's very helpful for a colleague, especially one who's not in my office, to have that Trello board link and be able to follow me as I'm doing it like on their own time. And finally, Google Slides, which we use a lot just because it's so visual and we can take like snapshots of what we're doing and share them with each other in a really easy way. So we've talked a lot about scalable design processes, tools, and even like organizational design. And all of us have, all of this has enabled us to think about design in different ways. And hopefully um, those can be useful to you too. So um, design can scale. However, besides all these things that we have talked about, we have found that it is all for nothing if we do not have the most important thing. We need a great product team. So for design to truly scale, we absolutely need to collaborate and get the inputs from our product and engineering counterparts. So for example, in the icons project that I mentioned before, it might seem like a really design-centric project, but even if all the designers align across in our mocks, it really means nothing if we are, an, un, if we are unable to work with our product teams to ensure that consistency actually lives in our product. So with that final caveat, <laughs> we're done with our talk. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions, or if you have feelings, or you want to share about your day, or if we want to sing Desmond a birthday song. <laughs> yeah, any questions? Oh, yeah, so um, you may have noticed some random people giving out swag. Uh, so that's our design team. So if you ask a question, you get swag. That's <laughs> simple, simple. Feelings? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question is, how do we work with our product and engineering teams? So our engineers are very difficult. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, so we work in Scrum teams. So we're attached to, to usually now it's like maybe two, one or two Scrum teams each. And each Scrum team has maybe like um, three to four engineers with and one product manager. So we so some teams do things differently. Some of them have daily stand-ups. Some of them have virtual stand-ups. Um, but yeah, essentially they work in a sprint style. Oh, yeah. some of them also. <laughs> it kind of depends on the scrub team. But most of them work in a sprint kind of like two-week sprint, and then we participate in those plannings. We try to be as embedded in our in our scrum teams as much as we can because we found that really helps. Like if an engineer is trying to execute like or, or you know work on a design that you've done. Definitely, it's super helpful and they can just feel like they can come up to you and be like, hey, can we talk about this? Yeah, so we try to be as close to them as we can, yeah. 
And also in terms of sprints, usually when we are creating like a feature or something, the design usually comes before that, so that we will, we will kind of do our design, our mocks, then we will share them with the engineers and the product managers, and then they will give us their feedback, and then we iterate over and over again until we find a perfect, or not perfect, find a solution at, that is good at that point of time, and then that's when the engineering team starts building it. Yeah, We're also really lucky that we work with product managers who really um, uh, respect and, and value the design input. So a lot of the time, even if we're like talking about a feature, I think we're really lucky that we have product managers who um, we can work with really closely to talk about like that feature and talk it through. Yeah, so we're quite lucky. Mm. Uh, so for those who, who may not have heard that, how do we deal with uh, changing design inconsistencies to be consistent, especially when there may be like p uh, people who are already using our product? Yeah, it's true, it can be quite painful. <laughs> um, so we do have to be very like uh, mindful of that. So definitely, f especially for our products that are more developed, like Zendesk Support and Zendesk Chat, which have hundreds of thousands of, of, of existing users, we do have to be very careful and like, you know, make sure that we're listening to their feedback really closely. A lot of the time we dog food a lot of, I mean, we use all our own products. So for example, if we're gonna push out a change in Zenus Chat, we will a lot of the time test it on our own advocates. So we'll, we'll push out the change on their dashboards only and we'll quickly get their feedback. So that's one way that we have found to be really helpful. So, Cause they use it every day, just like our customers. So if they hate something, they're gonna let us no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we also try to incrementally change mm -hmm. our design. So it's not like um, this is the product now and then boom, then like there's a whole new product. So we slowly change, like maybe we, we change the font, mm -hmm. then we change a certain button, and then like slowly, slowly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, are still on, we are still working on yeah. it. So it's, we, we haven't really completely solved our inconsistency problem yet. yet. Anyone else? Oh, yep. So sadly, neither of us were here during the acquisition. It happened three years ago. I joined right after it um, as well, and she joined about a year ago. Uh, there are other designers here who were around <laughs> during the acquisition, but all of them are not meeting my eyeline. So uh, it was, I can say it was, it was definitely interesting. I think that the culture here was really, really strong because it was a startup, right? I mean, the, the, the super tight knit and very, very strong in their own identity. And then I think when the acquisition happened, there were a lot of shifts that had to be made. We had to get a lot more used to being, again, all those things that we just shared, all the, like, being super open about all our design thinking, documenting why we decide to do something, um, just making sure that if someone is not literally sitting next to me, they know what I'm doing. All that really pain painful and sometimes can be tedious stuff, but I think the team really had to make that extra effort to put in all those processes, yeah. That was a major part. But I think also we, um, yeah, again, you know, the, the global creative team, we love to like get together in one country, so that also helps. <laughs> Uh, which teams? Oh, across like the design teams and if we're like working on one project? Oh, okay. So he's asking how do we communicate across the different teams, especially globally. So that happens, that's a great question. Um, that happens very often where I'm working on a design pattern, someone else is working on a different design pattern and sometimes it's really hard to like communicate and get that resolution. So the garden team, which Simon mentioned, is actually a big part of that. They tend to arbitrate a lot of this. So if I'm working on say like a, a drop down menu, for example, and someone else is working on a a different drop down menu and it's more than just UI right it's UX it's like how it works and all the different states and all the different components um, they can be the ones who really will step in and be like okay give me all your feelings and thoughts and then they'll go and write it down and then they'll go and experiment so having that team dedicated to like components has actually been a huge help do you have anything to add <laughs> okay <laughs> is there anyone from like this side that has questions Um, 
Um, so uh, she's asking, was the garden team initially a full-time a full-time job? Um, it was, I think, sort of like maybe 60% of one of the designers in SF's time. And then very quickly, they started ramping up. But yeah, it definitely didn't start off as like, okay, you know, you only do this. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we have like the 1.5 yeah. or so. <laughs> so. We still have the 1.5. One of the designers is working half on like another product and half on garden. We are, we are realizing that the, the, mm. the, the design system is also quite important, so we are trying mm. to build up that team as well. Um, yeah, maybe we'll take one more question because it's hot. <laughs> I feel warm. Do you all feel warm? Is it just me? Sorry. I think uh, back there. Right. Uh, so the design system, we use brand.ai. So the design uh, library is maintained by the garden team and they are like upload assets and then we're able to drag and drop. So they tell us when they've released a new version, they're like, yay, we released version three and then we all go and update and then we can just drag and drop. And usually they are, they are really, they're becoming more and more detailed in their documentation. So if they've released some new component, we have all read about it for weeks and we know it's coming. Yeah. Sorry, go on. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. So if we want a new icon, do we just create it and send it to them? Uh, sometimes we do, especially if it's very specific. Like if, if it's very specific to something that I know only my product is really going to use, I'll probably just create it and then like let them know and let them add it in. But if it's a very general one, yeah, so sometimes um, we will have designers, because we have a Slack channel, sometimes we have designers who will like comment and say that, hey, guys, I need a an, an thumbs up icon. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else have it? Then, then people who have those icons will actually reply to that, and we try to kind of use the same or align. And then if there are more and more people who need the icon, then the garden team will come in and be like, okay, this seems like um, it's needed across many, many designers, so we will try and build it very ad hoc. La. We don't have that much process around it. Yeah. Okay, I feel very warm. Let's stop. <laughs> okay, so um, feel free to come and talk to us later. Uh, yeah. Happy birthday, Desmond. <laughs> <laughs>